Welcome back, everybody. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, there's so much news to go over. We have a lot to cover in this episode. First of all, Apple reached the $2 trillion mark. So this is obviously a monumental achievement. They are the only company to be worth $2 trillion. The saga between Apple and Epic Games continues. We now get to see the other side of it. So far, I've done episodes showing what Epic's, what their whole case is. And I've made what I think are the best arguments for Apple. And Apple actually made their own arguments because Apple filed a counterclaim against Epic. And Apple's counterclaim is pretty funny to read through. It is pretty funny because they highlight uh, a lot of the arguments some people are making against Epic. A lot of the hypocrisies. They call the whole situation a hot mess. There's some funny parts that we'll be highlighting in this episode. And then, of course, we have the Tesla news. It's worth over $2,000 a share. The company has a market cap bigger than Walmart. And that is an incredible achievement. Tesla is now up in the ranks with the big boys, the best companies in the world, world-class companies like Visa and Johnson & Johnson. Tesla's right behind them. So passing up Walmart, this is no joke anymore. Tesla's being valued as a gargantuan, dominant, world-class company. Can they stay this way? Will they be able to show that they're really worth almost $400 billion? We'll discuss that in this episode. And then we have the news that I think is a little bit overblown, which is Warren Buffett purchased a gold mining stock. A lot of people are saying gold and Warren Buffett. How can these two things go together? I'm going to be explaining why this really has been overblown. It's not really such a big deal for a couple different reasons. And then, of course, we have my portfolio update, what companies I'm buying, and I'll be responding to comments and questions as well. Now, first, before we jump into any of that, I have to mention the Joseph Carlson Show is on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. It's on Google Podcasts. It's on YouTube. Basically, if you search the Joseph Carlson Show anywhere, it's going to be in your feed. So feel free to subscribe any one of those places. It's completely free. If you want even more content than that, if you want more discussion, you can check out the Discord. I'm on that basically every single day. And if you're on YouTube, remember to hit the the subscribe button with the bell thing so that you actually get alerts when, when I post new videos. Okay, let's first jump into the headline news, which is Apple reached the $2 trillion mark. They actually surpassed it this week. Now they're like $2.1 trillion. This happened for a couple reasons. One of them, I believe, was because Apple had uh, an amazing earnings report that helped be a catalyst for this achievement. I think Apple, relative to all of its competitors, was basically undervalued compared to everything else in the market about two months ago. I bought it when it had almost a 27 PE ratio. Now it has like a 35, 36 PE ratio. So it was undervalued. And now that gap of being undervalued has kind of diminished. So here we are with Apple at $2 trillion. It makes up by far my largest holding my portfolio. But what I want to mention is one thing right off the bat. This little pet peeve that I have is people comparing the market cap of companies to the GDP of countries. What is this comparison that we're doing? We're comparing the market cap of Apple to the GDP of different countries. What is the point of this? Let me give an example of CNBC doing this. You got Tim Cook, nine years as CEO, officially now a billionaire himself, uh, guiding a company with market cap larger than the GDP of many, many countries. Uh, and He's saying the market cap of Apple is bigger than the GDP of many, many countries. And this is something that CNBC has repeated many times, this comparison being made. It is true. The GDP of Canada is only $1.7 trillion, as opposed to the $2 trillion market cap of Apple. The GDP of Australia is only $1.4 trillion. But why are we comparing these two things? They're not comparable. A GDP is a measurement of, of economic activity. It's not a measurement of value. The market cap is a measurement of value. So you're comparing apples and oranges. I don't know why this keeps getting repeated. I think it just confuses people. If you were to do an accurate comparison, you'd have to find the market cap of Canada, which means that you'd have to add up all of the assets, all of the real estate, all of their stock market, really the market cap of Canada, which would be multiples, probably 100 or 1,000 times bigger than the market cap of Apple. So I just wanted to point this out. These two things aren't comparable, and I don't know why I keep seeing the news bring it up. Now, aside from that little pet peeve there, uh, the news is correct in saying that this is a monumental achievement for Apple. Hitting $2 trillion is pretty incredible, and Apple is in one of the most complex public debates, a public battle with Epic Games. This continues on. Apple filed their own motion to oppose Epic Games' temporary restraining order. And this is where you see Apple lay out their entire case against Epic Games. Now, this counter complaint is about 28 pages long. 
So we're not going to read through all of it here. I've read through all of it already. I'm going to go through and highlight what I think are the strongest points that Apple makes throughout this, because it is interesting to see from their side. So far, everybody has kind of looked at Epic's complaints, and then uh, they've just discussed what they think Apple might respond, what Apple's argument could be. But now we get a chance to actually see what Apple has to say. They say that developers who work to deceive Apple, as Epic has done here, are terminated. So when Epic willfully and knowfully breached its agreements by secretly installing a hotfix into its app to bypass Apple's payment system and app review process, it knew full well what would happen, and in doing so has knowingly and purposely created the harm to the game players and developers it is now asking the court to step in and remedy. Now this next point that Apple makes I think is the strongest point, and it's the most repeated point that Apple makes all throughout this claim. They say that all of the problems that Epic is facing all of the damages to the developers, uh, to their company, them potentially losing business ties with Apple, all of it is self-inflicted. That is what Apple's saying. It's self-inflicted wounds. They say first, the temporary restraining order exists to remedy irreparable harm, not easily repairable self-inflicted wounds. Here, Epic executed a carefully orchestrated, multifaceted campaign complete with a parody video, merchandise, hashtag belligerent tweets, and now a prepackaged temporary restraining order. All the injury Epic claims to itself, game players, and developers could have been avoided if Epic filed its lawsuit without breaching its agreements. All of that alleged injury for which Epic improperly seeks emergency relief could disappear tomorrow if Epic cured its breach. Apple has offered Epic the opportunity to cure, to go back to the status quo before Epic installed its hotfix that turned into a hot mess. But Epic does not want to remedy the harm that it contends requires immediate relief because it has a different goal in mind. It wants the courts to allow it a free ride on Apple's innovation, intellectual property, and user trust. That is the biggest point that Apple makes, that all of this is self-inflicted, that Epic could come back to the App Store right now if they stop violating Apple's rules. And if they have a problem with Apple's rules, if they think that they're illegal, if they think there's antitrust issues, then they should take that the normal direction through the courts. What they shouldn't do is intentionally violate the current rules that are legal under the current law and go about doing things that way, doing a smear campaign, violating their rules, and then complaining to the courts when Apple severs business ties. Apple's saying if you don't like the rules, change them through the courts. Now in this counterclaim from Apple, they do make a bunch of other points. Apple compares bypassing their in-app purchase system to shoplifting. They say, quote, without in-app purchase, Apple would be unable from a technical perspective to charge app developers a commission on in-app sales. If developers can avoid the digital checkout, it is the same as if a customer leaves the Apple retail store without paying for shoplifted products. Apple does not get paid. Apple points out that they're not unique at all in their in-app purchase system. They say, quote, Apple's commission is hardly unique. Google Play Store, the Amazon App Store, the Microsoft Store, and many video game digital marketplaces such as Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, and Steam all have similar fees and requirements to use marketplaces, official in-app purchase functionality. Another point that Apple makes is that the security concerns are not fake concerns and that outside of the iOS app store, Fortnite has had problems with malware. Fortnite announced that Android versions of the game would be available on the web and immediately sites appeared that not only advertise Android Fortnite, but also distributed malware in the game. As one commenter noted, quote, unsurprisingly, Malware versions of Fortnite targeted unsuspecting gamers, which is what malicious individuals would do with any popular app that's available from outside the App Store. By 2019, Epic acknowledged security vulnerabilities in non-iOS versions of Fortnite that exposed hundreds of millions of players to being hacked. And then the last thing that I'll mention that Apple does point out is that Epic had previously asked Apple for special exemptions, special rules around them before launching this whole lawsuit. They say, quote, on June 30th, 2020, Epic emailed Apple requesting to offer a competing Epic Game Store app through the App Store that would allow iOS device users to install apps from Epic directly rather than through the App Store and to offer payment processing options within Epic's app other than in-app purchases. So there you have a few of the main points that Apple brings up. There's no way to know how this will turn out. But if I had to guess, I would say that I think Apple has a stronger case. Okay, now moving on from Apple, I need to talk about another company that's had enormous gains over the past month, over the past couple of weeks, and that is Tesla. If we look at the ranking here, this is the highest market cap companies from top to bottom. At the very top, we have Apple, then Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Berkshire Hathaway, TSM, J&J, Visa, 
And then right there in place 11, we have Tesla. It's moved above Walmart. This is incredible. This is rank 11 of the most valuable companies on our stock exchanges. That is pretty remarkable for Tesla. It sits at a current value of $382 billion. Think about that for a minute. Look where this company currently sits. It sits amongst world-class companies. You have Walmart, which is one of the strongest companies in the world. It has stores everywhere. It owns Sam's Club. It has distribution centers. It has logistics. It has online growth. So Walmart's not some company that's seen its day and it's not growing anymore. Walmart has had strong online growth. So this is still a company that has growth ahead of it. And Tesla has moved above it. Then right above it, we have Johnson & Johnson. Tesla's right there with this company, within $20 billion. Johnson & Johnson is, of course, the biggest pharmacy company in the world that has a mixture of devices, they have a mixture of pharmaceuticals, and they have a mixture of retail products they sell. Well established. It's been around for 100 years. So I hope this gives you an appreciation for what Tesla has been able to accomplish. It's now in the midst of world-class, globally dominant companies in the respective industries and categories. As far as valuation goes, I can't say whether Tesla is undervalued or overvalued. It's really impossible because there's been a million people that have said Tesla is overvalued. They were saying that when Tesla was $400 a share and here it is $2,000 a share. So saying whether it's overvalued or undervalued is very difficult to do. When I look at valuation, what I do is I basically look at the market cap and I look at it in comparison to other companies. Is Tesla worth about as much as Visa? That's a question you can ask yourself. Is it worth about as much as Johnson & Johnson or Walmart or Procter & Gamble? Which one is going to give you a better return over the next 10 years? You can also compare it to other companies like, is Tesla worth about as much as Netflix and Disney put together? That's something else you can ask yourself. If we were to look at the upside for Tesla, let's go ahead and, and say that we're investing in Tesla right now. And we invest in Tesla as a growth company. You're not investing in Tesla because of the dividends. It's not Johnson & Johnson. You're not investing in Tesla for the 4% stable yield and uh, you know, moderately growing business like Johnson & Johnson. It grew 15% for the year, plus it pays a 3 to 4% yield. Not the best returns, but it does decent. Johnson & Johnson has done good for shareholders. Nobody's investing in Tesla for that type of investment. When you invest in Tesla, you want double your money. You want to make double. You want this company to go up 100%. You're not investing in it because of dividends. So let's go ahead and examine that possibility. What if Tesla became worth double? That would make it worth more than Facebook. That would make it be the fifth biggest company in the world. That would put it right in the middle of Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple. Keep in mind that these companies are basically in a category of their own. They make up like 25% of the total stock market. All of them have complete dominance in their massive categories. Facebook and Google each control the advertising market. And that's just one portion of their business. They control the advertising market. Microsoft has basically every desktop computer plus an enormous amount of software that businesses use. They're dominant in that regard. Amazon controls a huge portion of online retail. And of course, AWS hosting a huge portion of the internet. And then Apple controls a big portion of the high-end phone market possibly the most important device in people's lives. That's the companies that Tesla, if it were to double, would be in the midst of. And think about that, can Tesla do that? These companies, Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft, and Google, and Facebook, their biggest problem right now is that they're too good. They're too big. They evolve and grow into different markets at ease. They have so much talent between all the engineers and developers and business people in these companies that they continue to dominate every single market that they go into. And their biggest risk right now is being too good at what they do to the point where they're going to receive regulation. They're going to be broken up. They're going to have legislators go after them. So that's the category that Tesla would be in if it were to double. The purpose of people investing in Tesla is to double your money, not to earn a stable dividend, not to have moderate returns. It's because you want this company to go up in value. So if you think about this, you can look at the risk reward. It's worth about $380 billion. I do think Tesla is a fantastic company. I do think it will be one of the biggest car manufacturers in the world. In volume of sales and in uh, importance, I do think it will be a huge company. But whether it can grow that much from this point onward is really difficult to say. So I think that new investors entering into Tesla right now, because of the hype and the excitement, the amount of news that Tesla has made, I think they might be disappointed if the growth doesn't keep going at the same rate that it previously has. It's ran up over 800% this year, and that can't continue to go if that happened 
next year, it would be worth more than Apple. So maybe that will happen, but I would have to see more to justify that price. So while I do think there's upside with Tesla, I think that the rate that it's currently growing will have to slow quite a bit. Okay, now moving on from that, the last bit of news that I want to cover is this whole drama over Warren Buffett buying gold, buying a gold mining stock. It came out that Berkshire Hathaway bought about 21 million shares of gold miner Barrick Gold, spending about $563 million. When this made the news, a lot of people were confused. Let's look at some of the things that they've said previously about gold. I think gold is a great thing to sew into your garments if you're a Jewish family in Vienna in 1939, but mm. I think civilized people don't buy gold. They invest in productive businesses. There's Charlie Munger saying that civilized people don't buy gold. Charlie Munger isn't the only one. Warren Buffett has repeatedly said that he doesn't buy gold because it's not a productive asset. If you buy an ounce of gold today and you hold it 100 years, you can go to it every day and you can, you can coo to it and you can caress it and, and you can fondle it. And, and, and 100 years from now, you'll have one ounce of gold and it won't have done anything for you in between. If you buy 100 acres of farmland, it will produce for you every year. You can use that money to buy more farmland. You can do it, all kinds of things. For, for 100 years, it'll produce things for you. And you still have 100 acres of farmland at the end of the uh, 100 years. He says gold's not productive. Productive assets will give better returns over long periods of time. Now, with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger saying things like that in the past, and now they're they're buying gold mining stocks, there's been a lot of articles like this written. Warren Buffett changes his mind on gold. He will panic buy Bitcoin at 50,000. So there's lots of people saying that he's changed his mind, that he's rushing to gold, that he's betting against the US, and that his actions are a contradiction to his earlier statements. I don't think that's true at all. Warren Buffett hasn't changed his mind. He's not contradicting himself. Uh, what he's doing is buying a productive asset. Gold is not productive. A gold mining company is productive. Gold has no profits. A gold mining company has profits. Gold has no intrinsic value. A gold mining company has intrinsic value. So what he's doing is not a contradiction to their earlier statements. What Warren Buffett did was buy a stake in a productive company that gives profits and returns. Another thing I'll mention is I'm personally doubtful that Warren Buffett was the one that found this company and invested half a billion dollars into it. I really doubt that. I bet it was somebody else at Berkshire, aside from Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, that really found this Barrick Gold Company invested in it. So Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have not been making all the buys for Berkshire Hathaway. They are getting very old. Eventually, they are going to die, unfortunately. And the company does have to continue on in their absence. So they know about that. They've been setting up other people that have been doing buys. The strategy of Berkshire is going to evolve over time. I think we'll see more companies like Amazon, MasterCard, Apple, these type of tech companies that haven't really been Warren Buffett's forte. So I think there'll be more companies like that. Barrett Gold is probably a company that one of the other equity managers at Berkshire saw some value in and they purchased it. Okay, now let's move on to the portfolio update. This is my passive income portfolio. The money in it is real. It's closing in on $120,000. I show this portfolio and an update of it every single week, week by week, good or bad. So you can see what happens, whether we lose money, we gain money, uh, anything that happens with it, I'm gonna continue to show it on this channel every single week. Now, if you wanna look at the actual holdings that I have, every single company and the percentage I have allocated to it, there's a link in the description that allows you to look at that. But what I wanna do is talk about some recent purchases that I've made and some things that have happened with my portfolio. A huge portion of my portfolio is in Apple. And there's a reason why I purchased so much Apple. I wanna go over a couple of those reasons here. The first one is that I had a lot of bonds before I purchased Apple. I had like $15,000 in bonds. And one thing that has happened with bonds over the past year is the yield has tanked precipitously. It's gone down like crazy over the last year. For instance, the one-year treasury yield is at 0.13%. It's basically giving you no money. And the real return of it after inflation is negative. So you're locking in a negative return with a one-year treasury. Likewise, with the 10-year treasury, it's only giving you a 1% return. The real return is also negative with it. And you can see how much it's declined over the past year. It continues to fall. Then we look at the 30-year treasury. 1.35% to lock in your money for 30 years. The yields on bonds has gone down like crazy over the past year. Now, not only has the yield on bonds gone down, 
which I was holding, but also companies have been cutting their dividends left and right. There's lots of companies that have been shut down, completely closed, that have been cutting their dividends. So what I did was I looked for a company that both had a decent yield, similar to the bonds that I was holding, but it was also a yield that would continue to go up as the company paid more money, and a company that would not cut its dividend. And what I found was Apple, at the time, was undervalued. At the time that I purchased it, the average share price was $355. That means that it was yielding above 1%, and at that time, it had a P.E. ratio of about 27. Right now, the P.E. ratio is like 36. So what I did was I simply moved my money out of these bonds, and I bought a company with a higher yield, and I thought it had a lot more upside. So I looked at Apple as a win, win, win. It had a higher yield, had a very safe dividend, and it had a lot of upside. That's the reason I moved like $15,000 from bonds into Apple. That's turned out to be a a decent decision because right now the company sits at a gain of $6,600. And I know the percentage underneath is really confusing. I've really made closer to a 36% return with Apple, not a thousand percent return. But regardless, I put all this money in Apple, like $15,000, and now it's grown to over $22,000 in the course of a month and a half, like six weeks. So the question is, what do I do with this company? If I look at it compared to other companies in my portfolio, it is way overweight. I mean, it's like the size of my other top three holdings. It's like the size of Disney, JP Morgan, and AT&T. So I'm way overweight in Apple. It makes up a significant portion of my portfolio. And I posted this on my YouTube community page. You'll see these posts show up and be able to respond to them if you subscribe to the channel. But I asked everybody, What should I do? Should I trim Apple, sell some of the the gains of it and put that into other companies? Or should I just continue to hold it? And the response was split. There was some people that said, you should probably trim some of it. There's a lot of people just saying, let it ride, that don't cut your winners. Uh, I decided overall that I'm going to continue to hold Apple. And I wanna point out that this is not solid portfolio management. If you went to a real portfolio manager, and they saw that 20% of your portfolio was in one company, they would have no part of that. No really good manager would want you to do that. So I'm doing this somewhat irresponsibly putting a huge portion of my my portfolio in Apple. And I want to point that out. So I wouldn't necessarily try to do this with your own portfolio. I wouldn't try to put such a huge amount of money into one company. That's what I'm doing. I continue to hold Apple, and it does put me at some risk. Because if Apple does have some big pullback, you'll see these gains go down like crazy even if the rest of my portfolio does well. So that's the risk with it. But I look at the risk of trying to trim Apple and sell out of it a little bit. The company's really good and it could continue to just do well in the future. Apple makes tens of billions of dollars of profit every single quarter. So I consider the risks of holding it and selling it. And I just like the idea of holding on to it more. So that's what I plan on doing. Now, aside from Apple, we can look at other companies that I've been purchasing. I've been purchasing a little bit of AT&T. Now I have about 180 shares. Right now, AT&T trades at under $30 a share. So even though this company has a lot of problems, those problems are priced into the company. It's trading at a a pretty low price right now. So AT&T is not a completely solid bet. There's still some issues with the company, but I do think it's, it's trading at a significant discount regardless. In the healthcare sector, I've been buying AbbVie. Like AT&T, this is a high yielding company. It yields about 5% currently. So I've been building up my position in this company. I think it both has dividend growth and it has value growth ahead of it. So that's one company I've been purchasing a little bit of. In consumer, I've been buying Disney. That's a company that has its dividend frozen right now, but I do expect them to unfreeze that dividend when they get their parks fully functional. This is a company that I do think has dividends ahead of it and a lot of capital growth. So I think that we'll see both of that from Disney. And in real estate, I haven't made any purchases recently. This has been the most hard hit portion of my portfolio. I'm still down about $2,000 in real estate, but Berkshire Hathaway's recent purchases of store capital does have me interested in this company. So I'll be doing more research on store capital. And if I do think it's a good buy, I'll probably be putting more money in this one. Now I do track my passive income on a chart here. Month to month, I track how much money I make in dividends or interest. Last month in July, I was paid $287 in dividends. That's pretty good. That's right on track of of where I'm going. I'm trying to hit $400 by the end of the year, but I think it's going to be very difficult to do. If I look at this, the trend has been very consistent. My passive income is growing over time. Two years ago, I wasn't earning anything in passive income just wasn't existent, $0 in January, $0 in February. And then it started off small, continued to grow as I continued to deposit new money, as well as reinvest every single dividend that I was paid 
into new companies, into different companies that also pay dividends. And overall, that cycle continues to go. Now I'm at the point where my portfolio is generating hundreds of dollars a month that I continue to reinvest and buy new shares of different companies. So this cycle keeps going. This is partly what Warren Buffett did with his career. He purchased companies that had a high amount of cash flow. He used that cash flow to purchase new companies that also increased his cash flow. And he did that cycle over and over again. So I do feel like I'm doing that on a smaller scale here. I can see this even clearer with the quarterly dividends. In Q2 of 2020, I earned $788 in dividends. That's pretty good. Almost $800 in dividends in three months. So this is becoming a real amount of money that's getting paid to me. And all of this money from every quarter has been reinvested back into the portfolio, buying new shares of different companies that also pay dividends. So I want this to continue to grow. I want this to get to a point where it's a substantial stream of income. I can either open up new positions in different companies with the dividends I'm being paid or reinvest them into ones that I think have good value and good growth potential. So that's the direction I'm going and we'll see how this goes throughout the rest of the year. Now let's move on and get to my reaction to emails and comments from the previous episode. This is a comment left from Will. He says, Joseph, two things. One, I think you need to clarify that you're choosing companies that have the opportunity to grow market share with the expectation that they'll increase their dividends in the future. Otherwise, it would seem you're orienting your portfolio more towards growth rather than passive income. I think a part of what solidifies that argument is that you didn't mention in this video what your dividends are looking like right now or your expectations for future dividends based on streaming companies. Two, you should post or mention the streaming services you use. Okay, well, well, I appreciate the comment. It gives me a chance to address this because I did receive a lot of comments where people are saying things like, Joseph, you're investing based off the growth of a company. Shouldn't you be focusing on the dividend, not the growth of the company? Okay, if you're looking at this through that lens, realize that what I'm doing is dividend growth investing. That is the name of the strategy that I'm doing in this account. It's dividend growth investing. You cannot have a company grow its dividend year after year if the company itself does not grow. So people acting as though these two things are separate, like somehow uh, the growth of the company is one thing and then the dividend growth is a whole nother thing, they are inextricably linked. You cannot have a company that continues to grow its dividend for the next decade if the company itself doesn't grow its revenue and net income. It just can't happen. How do you expect the company to pay out shareholders more and more money every year if the company itself is not taking in more money. So that's one thing I see. People acting as though the growth of a company and the dividend growth are two separate things. They're completely wrong on this. They are one and the same. You have to have the company be growing its revenue year after year uh, if you want it to grow its dividend. Now in my portfolio, I focus on a variety of companies. One of my largest holdings is AT&T. That is a high starting yield. It's like 7% right now. The dividend really is stagnant. It's not growing much. So it's already at its kind of end of life with its dividend growth. Hopefully the company can continue to grow in the future so that it can grow its dividend over time. But right now I'm basically buying that company just based off its current yield. But there's other companies in between like Home Depot. Uh, there's other companies like AbbVie that have a 5% yield. There's other companies like Pepsi that have like a 3% yield and, and all these other companies in between. And then I also have a good group of companies that are, I think, at the start of their dividend growth. Companies like Microsoft and Apple that currently have like 0.7% or 1% yield, but they're growing rapidly, 20% year over year dividend growth. And I think it would be a mistake for dividend growth investors to only invest in the AT&Ts to only invest in the very high yield companies and to completely ignore the ones like Microsoft and Apple that have been growing their dividends aggressively over the past five years. For example, if you look at Microsoft and you go to a yield on cost basis, if you purchased Microsoft five years ago, your current yield on cost would be like 4.8%, almost a 5% yield on cost in five years. That is because they've been growing their dividend rapidly over the last five years. So I do think that investors get the wrong impression. You can't have the growth of the company and the dividend growth be two separate things. They are linked together. If the company tries to grow the dividend without the company growing itself, the dividend will eventually be cut. So that's the first thing. 
Now, in the case of Disney, it is true that I've been putting money into a company that currently right now has its dividend frozen. So Disney's not paying a dividend right now, but I still consider Disney a dividend company because I think that once they open back up their parks and once they're fully operational, I think that they'll reinstate their dividend program because they've shown a willingness to do that in the past. So I'm buying in Disney right now, believing that I'll get a cheaper price point than two years down the road when there's no uncertainty with it. That's what I'm doing with Disney. I think that they will be a dividend growth company again in the future. And I'm trying to get a better price point right now in that company. So I do absolutely have the future expectation that Disney will continue paying dividends. Now your next question, which streaming service do I use? I basically signed up for all of them right now just to see their product. It's probably not the most financially responsible thing to do, but in terms of investment, I wanna look at the product of each streaming service. Now, I guess over the past couple months, I probably watched the most from Apple TV Plus, basically because they have new series that I haven't seen. And I think so far they've been okay. Not amazing, but they've been okay. Uh, I think that they haven't had any real big hit that you have to see. I'd say that overall we've used Disney Plus a lot with the kids. I've watched some movies from HBO and then some TV series from Apple TV Plus. And then Netflix is usually just random documentaries or comedy specials that I'll use. They seem to really own that type of market. So I always keep Netflix because I think once in a while they'll always come out with interesting content. I think with all these streaming services, it is easy to tell that they've had content production issues. A lot of their stuff has been delayed. They can't produce it because of the coronavirus. So uh, it's difficult to find really good content right now, even with all of them. But I think that things open back up over the next year. Hopefully they'll be able to produce better content. Johnny Depth says, I'm not sure I agree with your sentiment that Disney can just mold itself into a lean tech streaming company. Disney is an extremely capital intensive business to run and well over half their income comes from experiences, cruises, hotels, parks, movies, a small fraction of their revenue to which they are not even profitable yet is streaming. In my opinion, buying Disney is risky, but I think a lot of investors are piling into it because of quote hope that Disney will see brighter days, but hope is not a strategy. Good luck. Well, Johnny Depth, I appreciate this comment. It gives me a chance to respond to it. Uh, I do think, of course, there's risk with every stock. Every stock, no matter what it is, is never a 100% sure thing. So that goes without saying, none of the companies that I'm buying, none of them are for sure things. At one point, I thought that Boeing was a good defensive company. And then two planes plummeted out of the sky and changed the, the story of that company. So anything can happen with these companies, including Disney. I will say, though, I do think that at least my investment into Disney is not based off of hope. 60 million subscribers on Disney Plus within nine months is not hope. That is a, a stat. This company was able to achieve 60 million subscribers within nine months time. That is pretty incredible. Now, if you look at Disney, they receive a lot of criticisms, like the one that you're giving here, that a small fraction of their revenue, to which they're not even profitable yet, is from streaming. That is a similar criticism that Netflix got early in Netflix days. If we go way back in time when Netflix was this little new streaming company, if you remember, Netflix had no original. There was no Netflix original content. They had to license all of their content from other cable companies. And those cable companies at that time viewed Netflix the exact same way that you're viewing Disney right now. This is this small company. It's not really a threat. They're not even profitable yet. So they viewed it in a very similar way. In fact, they viewed Netflix as easy money. Netflix would buy licenses to their content for a lot of money. And NBC would be glad to do this. They would say, yeah, you can license out The Office and Parks and Recreation and all of our best TV series. No problem. That's easy money for us, just based off of our content. They didn't view Netflix as a threat at all. Meanwhile, Netflix was building up its subscriber base. Not really charging them a lot, not worrying about profits, but just building up a subscriber base. This was NBC thinking that they were making easy money off of Netflix, while what they're really doing was building up their biggest competitor. They were building up their eventual demise, the company that would eventually steal tens of millions of their viewers. And this is what Netflix did. And Netflix did it for cheap. They licensed out other people's best content for years for cheap. NBC let them have the office for year after year after year and thought that that was benefiting them. In reality, all they did was build up Netflix. And Netflix knew that this was not going to last forever. Eventually, the old cable companies would wise up and they would not want to license out their content anymore. And so what Netflix did early on was start to produce their own content. 
They have Netflix originals, and now that makes up over 50% of their new content. So they are one of the biggest production companies in the world. I believe they spend the most on production than, than any company in the world. And now you have Netflix, so far in the lead, 192 million subscribers. Companies like NBC know they don't have a chance. Even with their new streaming service, Peacock, they offer a free version of it, ad supported, because they know they're way too far behind to start with a service that has monthly subscription like Netflix. You say that the streaming portion of Disney is not profitable yet. That's right, but it shouldn't be. They shouldn't be focusing on trying to make money out of their current subscribers. The focus is getting a land grab, getting as many subscribers as possible in as many different markets as possible, getting hundreds of millions of subscribers for Disney. That should be their focus, and that is the management's focus. It's not on making it as profitable as possible right now. Believe me, once Disney has a huge amount of subscribers, they will flex their pricing power. Netflix went from about $7 a month to now like $12 a month, and they gain subscribers the entire time. Disney will be able to do the same thing, but they need to gain as many subscribers as possible right now. That's the strategy. I don't think investors fully appreciate the change in dynamics of Disney's business model. And I think that comments like yours are self-evident of that. If you look at this, their movie production historically with Disney has been risky. They come out with these movies and they have to hit a home run. They have to have them be blockbusters to make the same amount of money that they made last year. Year after year after year, Disney has to hit home runs. Blockbuster movie after blockbuster movie. Can a company keep that up forever? Maybe, but it's very difficult to do. Right now, what they're doing is transitioning that portion of their business, making it so that they have to hit home run blockbuster movies year after year to a subscription business model. A subscription business model is superior. It gives you a reliable, predictable monthly income, one that you can increase gradually over time, where investors can have solid expectations of earnings of the company. Because of that predictability, investors will assign it a higher multiple. Once this becomes clear that Disney has transitioned one of their most volatile forms of income, which is movie production and making blockbuster hits, into a reliable monthly stream of income, investors, I think, will price it at a higher multiple. So that's a story with Disney. I think they're transitioning one segment of their business to a far better business model, and they're doing it quickly. I think that Disney will continue to gain subscribers at a pretty good speed. They've executed things really well. They'll come out with Mandalorian Season 2. People will want to watch that. And then we'll enter the Christmas season, and I think people will sign up for it there with all of their promotion. So I could see Disney getting to around 100 million subscribers by the end of this year. I think they could get close to that. So this is why I call Disney a misunderstood company. I think a lot of investors do not understand the transition that's happening with a highly volatile portion of their business. I don't think investors fully appreciate the benefits of moving to this superior model. I don't think investors understand the inherent benefits that Disney has with its content and how it will be able to scale on a global scale. Uh, I think there's so many things that investors right now are kind of muddled with. It's not very clear. And I think over the next two years, this will become increasingly clear. Investors will be able to see the benefits of it. Once Disney has 200 million subscribers in a ton of different markets and they have content that appeals broadly to all the different cultures, I think that investors will begin to appreciate it then, but the price will reflect that. So what I'm trying to do is buy into Disney before that happens. I'm buying into it during this confusion before things become more clear with it, because I think as it becomes more clear, I think the price will reflect that. Uh, so I'm trying to get ahead of that. Now I have to also mention, I could be wrong. Disney could have slower subscriber growth. Other streaming competitors could catch up and try to offer family content as well. There's other risks with the company. So every company, again, that I invest in has risk in it, but I think Disney has a, a pretty decent story. Okay, well, with that question, I'm gonna end this episode there. I appreciate everybody for listening. If you like the content, be sure to subscribe. It's free to do. I promise you can hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, and then YouTube actually notifies you when I post a video. So I appreciate everybody that does that, everybody that shares the channel with friends. I'll continue to answer your questions and give you updates on all the companies I'm investing in and how they turn out. So I'll see you guys next time.